I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. The Natural History Museum of the city of Rouen reopened in 2007 after almost 10 years of renovation work. The museum, however, has lost none of its old charm. It is one of the final remaining examples of what a museum was like in France at the dawn of the 20th century. It serves to both educate the public and act as a repository of all living things, carefully organized and minutely classified. The result is a landscape of impressions and images, such as hundreds of silent birds ready to take to the wing, or an immense gorilla, which guards the entrances to the second floor. Display cases filled with antique-looking animals set against a reconstructed jungle background plunge you into the Technicolor exploration films of the 1950s or a story by H.G. Wells. And yet a small revolution is taking place here. When one of the most famous pieces in the ethnology collection was removed, the perspective harmony of the museum was broken. This Maori head was returned to New Zealand. The display that you see here is a representation of it in 3D. It allows us to understand more about the artifact than when we had the head physically here in the collection in Rouen. But in order to fully understand the point of this process, you must first understand the amazing story of this Maori head. In 1875, a Monsieur Drouet donated a strange object to the museum's administrators. Mr. Drouet, good morning. Dear sir, I'm donating this object to you. It has brought us bad luck. The receipt from the period describes Monsieur Drouet's gift as an indigenous tattooed head of a yellow race from New Zealand. A tattooed skull, a Maori head. As to why Monsieur Drouet chose to be such a generous benefactor is unclear. 
Drouin Museum has just inherited a mummified and tattooed skull. A magnificent specimen. The experts later confirmed that it was in fact a decapitated head of a Maori warrior, a desirable collection piece with great value to contemporary ethnological study. For more than a century, the head was one of the main attractions of the Rouen Museum. By the 1990s, this type of exhibition was deemed to be politically incorrect. The Maori head was removed and put into storage. Then in 1996, the museum closed its doors for about 10 years for restoration work. In 2006, Sebastian Minchin was named the museum's director. In an inventory in preparation for the grand reopening, he and anthropologist Roger Bollet made an unusual discovery. When we found the Maori skull in the vaults at the Rouen Museum, it was sitting quietly in its little box, forgotten by almost everyone. I told myself, there are two solutions. Either we decide that this is the kind of thing we shouldn't show to the public, like a sort of skeleton in the closet, or the alternative is to do something positive, which will also help to put the museum here in Rouen in touch with people from where this head came from. For years, New Zealand's Maoris had been asking for it to be returned. And by this point, it was something of an old claim. More than 20 years had elapsed by the time we were asking ourselves, what are we going to do with it? So my first task as the newly named director of an institution categorized as a museum of France is to find myself facing some human remains that could be considered as a collection piece. It is in fact the sort of object that is at the very edge of what can be considered a collection piece and yet is still human remains. That was my first thought. The second point is that we have an indigenous people who are asking for the head to be returned. And so it is this question which I have to confront. Will I opt to go ahead with returning the head, knowing that in France such an action has never been done before? It's a really tricky situation. Then the third point is my own personal view of this head. Seeing a skull can shock some people, but this is a real head. That is to say, obviously there is a skull, but also skin and eyes. We can make out the gaze of the deceased. There are lips, ears, the roots of hair growing out. So this emphasizes even more the fact that this is an actual human head. So I found myself caught between these three different questions, three different problems, and I needed time to come to a solution. Before making any decisions, Sébastien Menchin decided to further his understanding of Maori culture. He turned to Roger Boulet, the specialist in Oceanian art. So that's the Druid collection. He's both a painter and a soldier. He draws all the different specimens of heads that he had assembled in his collection. That gave an idea of the number of specimens which had been collected by the end of the 19th century, from the middle of the century. And the types of tattoo vary greatly. The motifs and what appears on the left and right sides are not at all the same. Yes, there is often an interplay between the two sides of the moko. 
a sort of graphical relation. It isn't just simply symbols or identification marks. And that would just be an identity card. And there is also some more plastic around the face, something which, of course, combines both art and graphics. This Maori people have a long history. They are one of the many peoples of the Pacific, and these people travel. History and archaeology now describe them as people originating from Southeast Asia, specifically from the coasts of China. We can imagine what this odyssey must have been like 3,000 years ago. People began to invade the gigantic Pacific Ocean with its many islands. From this starting point, some groups headed to the farthest islands, like Hawaii, Easter Island, and New Zealand, where they began to settle from approximately 800 AD. So for us, in the time of Charlemagne. To understand why, for the Maori, the preservation of these heads was so important, we have to put them back into the more general context of the concept of the person as it was understood by these Pacific civilizations. The power of a person, their manner, to use the Polynesian term, is concentrated into his head, and so it is considered as the most important part of someone's personality. Furthermore, this idea of the importance of the head in Maori civilizations is further intensified by the act of decoration, the moko, which gives even more power and influence. Once the person dies, the head is kept within the family, as are the heads of enemy warriors of noble lineages, which might be captured in battle. Westerners arriving in New Zealand in the 19th century were fascinated by the tradition of tattoos and the symbolic importance they represented. Wanting to inform people back home about native customs, they created a substantial traffic of objects to the West and uncovered the significance of these beheadings. In the middle of the 19th century in Europe, all the natural history museums were in the process of being created. And this created huge demand across Europe for heads, skulls, and any other sort of sample that could bear witness to the physical characteristics of a certain number of peoples and races. It wasn't enough to gather or collect everything people were willing to give. This led, and it is the case with the Moko Mokai, the Maori heads, to very unsavory practices, such as choosing future museum pieces whilst they were still living. Now, this would happen and be denounced, and the dealer would still say, I'll be back in a few weeks or in two years and take delivery of my order. And what also happened, once demand had reached such high levels, was the fabrication of forgeries. Some heads were even tattooed and decorated after death. Just here, round the front. There. Yes, that's great. The reason for this digitizing session is to send the most accurate possible model of the head to our colleagues in New Zealand. The idea is to get down to a tenth of a millimeter so that we can discover straight away if we're dealing with an authentic Maori head or not. This is important because we know there were copies and also with the huge volume of traffic that took place at this time, this could easily be the head of a non-Maori which was tattooed after death or in fact even the head of a European. It would be a shame to start in motion a plan to return the head only to discover that what we actually have is a European head tattooed with Maori designs. 
This was the first ever head to be digitized in 3D by using an ultra-sophisticated device that operates at micron levels, called the Handyscan. We needed to be able to digitize the Maori head in order to be able to study it from every angle, inside and out, to study the tattoos in minute detail. Since we weren't able to touch the head, we calibrated the laser so it would be neither invasive nor intrusive, so as to not damage it. At the same time, we had to find a technique to take the photographic information and turn it into all the correct measurements. So it was thanks to the digitization and the system for dealing with the subsequent information that we were able to create an exact digital copy of the head. This allowed us to explore the head in the tiniest detail, from the tattoos to the thickness of the skull and even to cut the head into pieces and sections which was of course impossible before as we couldn't even touch the artifact. We quickly received a response from the scan and the results of our colleagues at the Te Papa Museum. They both proved that we did in fact have a true Maori head, identifying both the grain of the skin and the style of the tattoos, specifically those containing different bands at the bottom of the face, easily identifiable as being authentic. By 2006, Sebastian Manchin had taken the decision to return the Maori head to the New Zealand authorities. But before taking any official steps to begin the transfer, he had to make sure he had the political support of Rouen's municipal council. Catherine Morin Desailly, a former municipal councillor, was working for City Hall at the time and was in charge of cultural affairs. I immediately agreed with this proposition. First, because it came from the entire team of the museum. There were no disagreements amongst them. And above all, because it corresponded to the work plan that we had envisaged with the mayor of Rouen at the reopening of the museum. A responsible, durable museum that aligns perfectly with the chart of cultural diversity that UNESCO voted in 2005. So immediately, we wanted to reflect on the manner that we could restituate that which, by the law of 2002, was considered an object of the collection, but which were for us human remains. There was, however, a stumbling block before the process of returning the head could begin the law at the time which banned the removal of any object from the collection of French museums. For the object to be given back, administrators had to make full use of a loophole in the law concerning exhibits classified as human remains. We cited a law from 1996 dealing with bioethics because in France, human remains do not have a legal status. This law states that bodies and human remains cannot be subject to a property right, which was in fact the case with these Maori heads. The museum at Rouen, which dates back to the 1800s, had over the decades amassed a large number of human remains in its collections. For example, prehistoric bone skeletons, or more impressively, an Egyptian mummy. The majority of human remains are not on public display. In order to see them, you need permission to delve into the museum's vaults, where many surprises await. These are examples of human remains which are linked to human anatomy, to teaching and education. Here in the Natural History Museum, since the very start, it has been an institution of learning and research, where doctors would train, and so we have lots of examples of human remains, such as embryos and fetuses, from small to large. There are specimens preserved in formaldehyde or alcohol. Other specimens also exist, linked to medicine and education. And take, for example, this head. 
There are anatomical waxworks actually made of wax, but others were made from people condemned to death. So in fact, they contain human remains. At first glance, we think, yes, this is made of wax, but in actual fact, underneath, there is a human being. This one, for example, came from a hanging. We also have human remains linked to ethology, for example, weapons, which include pieces of skin. And uh, yes, here's an example. On this subject, we recently found in the archives a piece of skin of a prisoner, which was found in an envelope with the following description. Tattoos taken from the arm of the deceased during my residency. So this uh, doctor came into possession of this small piece of skin displaying a lewd tattoo. This dates from artifacts collected by one of the first directors of the Juan Natural History Museum, who used to study the damaging effects of tattoos. On the 23rd of October, 2007, the mayor of Rouen and the museum organized a ceremony for the handover of the head, which was attended by a special Maori delegation that had made the journey from New Zealand. The ceremony was taking place in the morning in the city hall, and the New Zealand delegation, headed by the New Zealand ambassador to France and the Maori delegation, arrived at the start of the morning. We then found out that Christine Albanel and the culture minister had blocked and refused our plans to return the head, summoning us to an administrative tribunal the next morning, where we were accused of violating the correct procedure, and that the object, being part of the historical wealth of France, should never have been removed from the collection. They are nonetheless social objects. They are ritual objects. And I think they have a very special status. You cannot consider them as just human remains, for example. The decision of the administrative tribunal fell at the end of December 2007. It decided against the return of the head as it cited a lack of legal precedent around the status of human remains. We're not able, from a legislative point of view, to identify it as human remains. And so, as we're unable to give this answer, by default, we have to call it a part of the collection. This put us at a total dead end regarding any potential of returning the head. When informed of the injunction, the Maoris, considering their mission a failure, decided to leave without ever coming face to face with the gaze of their ancestor in the Rouen Museum as tradition would have dictated. In the museum, the feeling of disappointment was palpable, but the meeting with the Maori community had not been in vain. Their exchanges and the closer cultural ties between the two parties have borne fruit. The focus switched to another piece in the collection, a magnificent canoe figurehead brought to Rouen in the 19th century by Admiral Cecile. It's funny to see that the eyes were not completed on this part. There, there it's complete. Georges Nuku, the artist with whom we were working at the time, told us, in fact, that the reason for making such holes was to allow the wind to pass through the sculpture at the level of the stern as well and that it, in fact, helped to lift the hull above the waves and, in, in doing so, move faster when performing an attack. It's miraculous that they are in this condition. Are you thinking of putting it in a cabinet or presenting it on a stand? Yes. Yes, the idea was for the typical visitor from Rouen to understand what role this object played in Maori culture. Because up until that point, we had the version of Admiral Cecile, a local military man who followed whalers through the 19th century, who found himself 
in a naval battle with Maori tribes from the island of Chatham. He took this as a trophy of war. Yes, the idea of this being only for decoration isn't so interesting. In fact, there is really something to say about this astonishing object. These are extremely complicated objects, not purely a piece of decoration. Even the motifs displayed on this great figurehead aren't just there for decorative purposes. They are a sort of book upon which the creation of the world is explained. How the world was created, how we passed from darkness into light, and the birth of certain characters who would go on to create the great Maori lineage. It's like a Bible for the Maoris. It tells us about the lineages and the particularities of each lineage's history. But it's very complicated, and we could easily spend hours describing the story of all these motifs and their connections. The Maoris are not attempting to reclaim highly symbolic objects like this. There are so many artifacts that they have to prioritize what to target. What they are most concerned with at the moment, and which specifically involves us, is the problem of heads and human remains. Because for them, these are not external objects. They are completely included in society. These are people, a powerful genealogical record. As for the objects themselves, they can wait. They're not a top priority. And there's an emerging trend among all the Pacific peoples. And this is the idea of ambassadorial objects. This is growing. It's the idea that artifacts in Western museums can help the people of war, of Paris, etc., discover these cultures, which are ancient and sometimes very difficult to decrypt. At the start of 2008, there were signs of a breakthrough as to the future of the head. Some in the scientific community showed their support for the museum and the city of Rouen. A committee in favor of returning the artifact was established, with a paleoanthropologist Pascal Pic at its head. The situation with these Maori heads can seem like something that we have never come across before. But there is a precedent, like the miserable story of the Hottentot Venus. This young woman became famous for having a very full, curvaceous body, as women from Hottentot still have, very developed buttocks with lots of subcutaneous fat, as well as large genitalia. And so the Hottentot Venus appeared on stage with cabaret acts in London. Then she was bought by a Frenchman. She went on to appear at international shows, creating a spectacle both sordid and naive. At this point in time, there wasn't the idea of racism as we think of it now. She lived in squalid conditions and died quite young. But most significantly, she became the subject of a dissection performed by Georges Cuvier, a great naturalist, but not a doctor. Certain parts of her body were removed and preserved, and she was still more or less on display at the Museum of Man until the 1970s. Almost a quarter of a century ago, President Mitterrand met President Nelson Mandela, where he asked France to return the remains of the body of Mrs. Sachi Bartman, better known as the Hottentot Venus. The French president had no reason to refuse. 
But he also wasn't aware that under French law, museum pieces cannot be returned. And so it provoked reactions from conservationists and the administration. Because of this, a specific bill had to be instigated so that a law could be passed with the help of the Senate. The Venus was indeed returned in January 2002. I had experience on this law on the return of the hot and top Venus from 2002, as it was bought by one of my centrist colleagues, Nicolas Abou, and I noticed that the criteria for performing a return were exactly the same. It dealt specifically with human remains, for Sachi Bartman as for the Maori heads, human remains that have become objects detrimental to human dignity, objects showing mistreatment and violence. So I immediately submitted a private bill which I wrote myself and had co-signed by my colleagues. Unfortunately, Experience shows us how much time is necessary before we can accept as one of us those people who appear different from us, either by their external appearance or by their customs. Charles Darwin said this in 1871, and unfortunately, it sounds just as pertinent as the story of the Maori heads at the Rouen Museum proves. This prospective law must allow France to be in tune with many other countries and to return, finally and rationally, all of the Maori heads, of which there are considered to be 15 and 20 in our museums today. What has guided us in this matter has been to be able to put France in tune with these other countries. France is the country of the rights of man, and it was not honorable of us to refuse to return these heads. We were 20 years late, and numerous heads have been returned to New Zealand by other countries. I would like to make it clear this law does not just concern the Maori head in the Rouen Museum, but all the heads preserved in all the museums in France. I put to the House this law in its entirety. Those who are in favor, please raise your hands. Against? Abstentions? There are none. The law is passed unanimously. Mr. Minister, you wish to take the floor. I simply wanted to make two observations. We don't build culture on the back of the trafficking of objects. We don't build culture on crime, and I think especially on slavery, on people who found themselves caught in horrible commercial traps, such as those once practiced by Europeans. Instead, culture is built on respect and mutual exchange by drawing on collective memory and on a certain number of laws and procedures. Further legal measures were taken and a commission was created to catalogue the artefacts with the specific aim of returning those classified as human remains. On the 29th of April 2010, Valérie Fourneron, the mayor of Rouen, steps up to defend the text of this law in front of the National Assembly. The law will be passed almost unanimously. Fortunately, there were amendments added to revive the National Scientific Commission of Museums. It was indispensable. Nothing happened between 2002 with the return of the Hottentot Venus to South Africa and now with the possible return of the Maori heads. Nothing happened regarding the reflection that this commission was obliged to engage in, that it had to be open to elected members and others, not just to conservationists, not simply for them to ponder and deliver a collective doctrine which would allow for those artifacts of human remains in all the museums in France to be treated in the same way, that it should be understood and that it should be taken into account the history of all of these different people who are asking us for the return of these remains. The handover ceremony is just a few days away. The only information that we have is from when it arrived in the museum in 1875, so half a century after the trafficking was outlawed. The skull is about to leave the collection of the Rouen Museum forever, but one question is bothering Sebastian Menchin. 
Can the head reveal any more secrets? So the director decides to conduct one final examination. With the help of well-known French forensic expert Philippe Charlier, The pathologist is a seasoned professional, having already identified the remains of some of the most famous characters in French history, including Agnès Sorel, Diane de Poitiers, or King Henry IV. There are several interesting things that I found on the head. The first was that there is a lot of hair still present. It cannot be seen, but can be felt at least a millimeter remains. On the chin, there is still a lot of hair too, which suggested that the head was probably male. It's a similar story around the mouth and eyebrow, although most of that hair had been rubbed away. However, the tooth is clearly a fake, most likely an animal tooth. We can see that the right ear has been double pierced, as had the left. Some insect damage can be seen in the mouth, the left eye socket, and even more so on the right. This one has not just been damaged by insects, but by rodents who have left marks all over the head. The advantage of studying the head using anthropological forensics is that many more scientific observations are recorded, and some historical ones too. The conclusion is that this here is the head of a male adult, young to middle-aged. This isn't an elderly person, as indicated by the condition of the teeth and the general appearance of the head overall. As with many other Maori heads or similar ones from this region, the inside was covered with clay to dry it out and stop decomposition after the head had been dried out and smoked. What Sébastien Manchin was most interested to discover was what the examination would reveal about the tattoos. On this subject, Philippe Charlier was unequivocal. Look at the tattoo. We can already say that these four bands, which are on the left and the right of the mouth, are the only ones made while the head was still living. All the others, those around the eyebrows, the forehead, the right hand cheekbone, were made after death. So there is no scarring. The edges still look very fresh, very abrupt, very visible, but there is no scarring. So these are the only real tattoos. All of this here, on the nose, and here on the right side, were carried out after death. Finally, on the 9th of May, 2011, Sébastien Manchin's greatest wish came true. The head in the Rouen Museum would finally be returned to the Maori people. And even better, it was symbolic of the fact it would be the first of around 15 heads in France that would eventually be returned to New Zealand. The Te Papa Museum in Wellington, New Zealand, is virtually a temple to Maori culture. It's a special day at the museum, entirely devoted to the return of ancestors to their native land. Uh, 
What is important in all this ceremony regarding the return of the heads is that it is a true internment. Everyone is dressed in black, the women in dresses, and the atmosphere is that of an actual funeral. This is the moment to be the most dignified possible, the most respectful possible, with regard to what's going to happen in the coming minutes. Several heads in a Maori warrior skeleton from Europe are welcomed by the Maori community in the heart of the Marae, a kind of chapel installed inside a museum. Sébastien Manchin attends the ceremony and is given the honor of accompanying the box holding the head to the center of the Marae. The act of carrying this box will allow me to be the only non-Maori during the whole of the ceremony. So it's a hugely important gesture with regards to consideration, respect and honor by the Maoris and the Te Papa team. I have to pay close attention to everything that goes on around me because I'm going to be right at the very heart of the ceremony. The ceremony begins after the haka with speeches from different tribal chiefs, which are very tough when we don't have the translation. The chiefs shout in the mare. In fact, in his speech, one of the chiefs explains that he must shout and speak loudly in Maori to awaken the soul of this warrior and to explain to him that he has come back to his homeland. He no longer knows how to speak Maori. It has been so long since he last spoke it. He surely has more chance of understanding French, English, or even Swedish than Maori. The chief of the tribe needs to shout very loudly in Maori to tell his ancestor, you have come back home and we are at your side. Now accepted into the Maori community in New Zealand, Sebastian is able to have a good look around the Te Papa Museum. His first visit is to the Standing Strong exhibition, dedicated to the cultural identity of the Maori people. This exhibition is very symbolic, as it will also be shown at the Quai Branly Museum in Paris, to mark the final ceremony when all the remaining heads kept in French museums will be returned to Te Papa. So the, the carvings depict ancestors that challenge and push them forward yes. to meet battle, yes. courage, and then there's ancestors down here representing the underworld. Mm. Lest you forget, boys, if, you don't, if you're not successful in battle, you know, you'll end up with your own ancestors in the underworld. Once the visit is over, Sebastian meets with Te Herekiki Herawini, who is in charge of returning objects at Te Papa. Despite having been in contact often, these two men have never had the time for a real face-to-face -face chat. As a member of the Maori community, what is your point of view concerning all the heads that are around the world? In 2003, when the repatriation program was, was started, we understand that there were over 100 um, Tuimoku overseas, um, but the number of Māori ancestral remains overseas was probably over 500. So it's very important for them to come home, back to their homeland. How many heads are there throughout the world at the moment? We estimate are still over, um, probably still over 100 or close to 100 now. We've repatriated probably about 30 over the last um, seven years, so there's still quite a number overseas. 
Now that the head from the Rouen Museum has been returned to New Zealand, what will happen with it? Uh, what, what happens with the toimoko when it returns back to Te Papa uh, from the Rouen Museum is that it's presently in our Wahi Tapu, so it's a sacred place. It's been placed there for, for um, a period of time. We're undertaking research now to find out the location of where the toimoko came from in the country. So research on the donor, the collectors, um, how it got from New Zealand overseas. And we're also looking at the designs of the moko, so the tattoo designs on the, the toy moko, to see if there are some regional designs. The type of research we don't do, we don't do DNA, DNA testing because Māori DNA comes from the Pacific and we have such a common DNA, so if we do a sample of Māori DNA on a Māori, all it shows is that they're from the Pacific. There's no specific lineage that um, identifies Māori tribal groups. And what will happen if the original tribe cannot be found? What we are undertaking at the moment is having hui or meetings around the country with the different tribal groups to look at what happens with um, unprovenance koi wetangata and so with unprovenance um, skeletal remains. So what we hope to do is achieve at the end of these dis dis discussions is a final, a final resting place. So a place where these ancestors may be buried um, and supported by all the tribal groups. Sebastian wondered who among the Maoris could make sense of the tattoos. The response from the Te Papa Museum was unanimous. Mark Kapua. He's in Titahi Bay, close to Marae, one hour by car from Wellington. As promised, Mark knows how to make these tattoos come to life, how to revive the warriors. Can you explain what uh, you see here? Okay, if we go back to the front here. Okay. Um, this sign here means that he's uh, born with the rights of a chief. It's a chief? Yeah, he's a chief. I'm not absolutely certain um, which iwi that he is, he's from. But um, either side of this pattern means that he was uh, a representative on a council of, of tribal chiefs. So there's only a few that, that sit on the council and make decisions, and uh, mm -hmm. he, was, he was one of them. And uh... A Bioba tattoo in the face. Uh, do you want to uh, turn the if yes? You can, yes. On the on this side? Mm, this uh, pattern here yes. means that um, he um, graduated from the old university, the university or the house of learning uh, from that time. Traditional university? Place of learning, yes. Maori. Maori one. Okay. Yeah. Why um, the two sides are different? Um, it's hard to say why that's like that. It's interesting that it is like that. Um, perhaps by the time he um, was, um, was killed, he may have only been quite young. Yes. And had been killed. And the rest of the work hadn't been, had not been completed. Because he's uh, young. Because he's young. And part of that is because around the mouth, um, there's, there's nothing. What that could mean is that, um, that he hadn't yet gained the access to be the spokesperson for that tribe. It would mean that his father was still alive, which meant that his father did all the talking. The discussion about the warrior and his life becomes very detailed. Here is meant that he was uh, in battle, and when he went to war, he led a war party. This pattern here is um, is a symbol of of, of war. He's big, a warrior. Big warrior. Big warrior. He's a, he command the, the the troops. Okay, and this side, this uh, over tattoo. I think that, that in here, it, it actually shows that he was a father. He had children. He had children. Mm -hmm. 
One, two. Oh, it doesn't. It looks like one. At, one. At, at the. How do you uh, see this? This little piece here, coming out there. It's uh, good that he's come home. He's been away a long time, so... Thank you. 